everyone. Welcome to a special edition of MIFA. I am Marlene Scott. Professor Josh Ellis sat down with director T.J. Martin, Academy Award winner for the documentary film Undefeated. Before we get started, here is a recap of the documentary. Let's see here. Starting right guard shot, no longer in school. Starting with linebacker shot, no longer in school. Two players fighting right in front of the coach. Starting center arrested. Most coaches, that would be pretty much a career's worth of crap to deal with. I think that sums up the last two weeks for me. For almost 14 years, we never won a football game. Oh my God in heaven. Chavis has serious anger issues. Stop, stop. You go over there, Mike. Montreal is dealing with the death of his father. When he died, I knew I was on my own. Number 77, O.C. Brown. O.C.'s well, grades wasn't up like they supposed to be. He's going to lose an opportunity to go do something with his life. I want them to rise above that or city knock. Man open, and he dropped it. The answer's about to fall to 0-1. Anybody can be a champ. It takes a man to stand up when this thing hits you in the mouth because it hurts. Everybody says when you get these inner city kids down, they'll lay over and you'll beat them by 40. Not us. You got to believe in yourselves, fellas. Four of those guys have taken some beating oh. here. There's a Manassas player down. God, I hope we didn't just lose him. Two things mean most. The thing to him in the world is his father and football. And we got to make sure we're there for him. Money, whatever you're going through, I promise you to give back. This is an unbelievably good opportunity. You're down 20 nothing. You come back from that, now you're talking about something. 103 to go. Season comes to a close for somebody here tonight. You think football builds character. It does not. He's going to throw it. He pulls it bigger. Football reveals character. This is it! Where does the idea of the making of the documentary, Undefeated, come from? Well, it all started after watching The Color Purple by Steven Spielberg, said T.J. Martin. It all started for me, honestly, it was when I was 11 years old, I saw Steven Spielberg's uh, The Color Purple. And uh, it, it didn't necessarily say, oh, I want to make films, but there's something that happened in that film uh, that kind of reached out at me emotionally and I recognized that I wanted to be able to do that for other people, some way, shape, or form in my future endeavors. TJ was introduced to documentary at a very young age. Like students, filmmakers, his friends were the crew. I was 19 and I took uh, a year off of college to make my first feature-length film, which is a feature documentary. Uh, and I did that with my best friend at the time. And that kind of was really the biggest learning curve that I had in terms of uh, my relationship with, with, with filmmaking. Um, and then from there, I just continued to do like, <clears throat> uh, like video production. Like I would shoot for other people uh, or I would edit for other people or I would do a, non a promotional video for a nonprofit. All the while, basically honing my skills uh, in, in all the different facets of filmmaking. You wonder why T.J. Martin chooses documentary over film? Well, the response is simple, freedom. One of the reasons that I got into documentaries uh, is because you don't, it, again, at the time, the, the medium had been a, more democratized. It was more accessible. Uh, so, and it's one of the few mediums where you don't have to ask permission to do it. So if I had an idea for a narrative film, uh, you have to gather so many resources and so many people to actually make that piece of work happen. Uh, and if you, if it's a, you know, if it's large in your head, big budgeted thing in your head, usually that requires a lot more money. What was great about documentaries um, is that I could pick up, I could take my iPhone out right now, ask Josh a couple questions, and craft a little story with it. I, literally, you can go do that. Pick up a camera, go talk to your grandparent, learn something, and actually craft it, something out of it. And so that was what was great about documentaries. It was an opportunity to tell stories that didn't, to be quite frank, didn't cost a lot of money. 
The documentary Undefeated was directed by T.J. Martin and Dane Lancey. Filming about 500 hours of footage must take a long time to capture and many decisions to make on a daily basis. But Professor Josh Ellis asked T.J. Martin how he feels about co-directing with Dane Lancey. It has its good days and it has its bad days. <laughs> but it, I mean, overall, it's I think the um, we get that question a lot, especially going out for jobs. They're so used to like there's one creative vision. But honestly, what's great is that uh, we always say that you you can't be precious with your ideas, and it and in having a creative partner, it forces you not to be precious with your ideas. Meaning, best idea in the room wins. I don't I don't care. It's not about because you came up with it. It's about we know we're trying to make this product, this thing we're working on. This is our baby what's going to be the best decision for this piece of work. And uh, you're, you're, you are reminded that in your face that every day, having a directing partner. And I think it's, it's awesome. It's great. Uh, and it also makes, like, we travel a lot for work, so it actually makes, you're going through these experiences with somebody, uh, and that, that kind of makes, doesn't make it as lonely of a world. They always say, like, directors, Part of the reasons they're kind of like they can kind of be curmudgeon y is because it's like the loneliest it's the loneliest job in the world. There's no one who actually can really resonate with your experience. Set is fun, but everyone is coming to you and you're supposed to have the answers for everything. And so to share that responsibility actually makes it much more fun. It makes set a little bit more lively. Um, but the biggest thing is, uh, is uh, you are constantly recognizing day to day, just in conversations, in creative conversations, you're recognizing your own weaknesses and hopefully if you have a good partner, you're working on those and you're working on them together and you're doing the same for that person. Yeah. For filmmakers, having their documentaries or movies being featured at a film festival is a precious goal but the process could be hard to break down. T.J. Martin gives us an inside view of the film festival circle. The festival circuit is designed, it's a market. It's designed so that you can uh, screen your film and hopefully a distributor picks up your film. They purchase it and say, okay, great, you are gonna, we're gonna distribute this product that you've been working on for years. Um, and that's what the, that's like, that's what you hope for. The other thing it's designed for is, is, is free press. So like an independent cinema, uh, there's not much budget, even in, for distributors, there's not much budget for what they call P&A, print and advertising. So the more free press that you can do, the better it is for the product. Um, so, so in our case, um, the ideal scenario, and for, for most people, unless you know you have an, an outstanding piece of work, Go, before going into the festival circuit, you know you kind of you want to start creating a bidding war. If you have, if you know for a fact this is going to sell, you want to create a bidding war. That's very, very, very rare. So, the ideal scenario is usually to try to drum up uh, buzz and attention before you go the festival circuit and get a pre-sale. So we had a <clears throat> film rep from WME, from William Morris Endeavor, the um, uh, talent agency. Uh, and uh, they started kind of doing screenings around town in Los Angeles and uh, they'd been trying to get it to Harvey Weinstein's hands and he's heard about it but he didn't want to deal with a little documentary uh, but because they just thought he would be a good fit for it um, but leading up to South by Southwest um, uh, Disney had finally watched it Disney started showing interest and then Paramount started showing interest and then Harvey caught wind of this and uh, we screened, we premiered on a Sunday at like nine o'clock at night. It was a late screening. And that morning, this is again, as story goes, is legend apparently, uh, a PA, a production assistant at WME, flew, hand flew, like hand delivered the film uh, uh, to Harvey's personal private screening room, uh, hand delivered from LA to New York that morning. Harvey watched it at noon. Uh, by 2.30, he went to his second in command, David Glasser, and said, uh, go to Austin and don't come back without that film. So an hour before our nine o'clock screening, we had a pre-cocktail thing, because it would have been, it was just gonna be uh, too late for, we had like a family and friends kind of cocktail thing before, the, uh, before we premiered. 
And this guy shows up that I've never seen in my entire life and says, hey, my name's David Glasser. I'm with the Weinstein Company. We want to buy your film. And I'm like, yeah, you're full of it. Get away from me. Uh, and then sure enough, it was David Glasser and he wanted to buy the film. So uh, that night there was a bidding war and the Weinstein Company purchased it uh, uh, like late in the evening. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we started, and then we kind of did a slow rollout. Um, we kind of uh, didn't do much because they wanted to kind of take advantage of the bigger festival circuit, the bigger, bigger festivals. So we were kind of quiet that summer and then did, started our rollout in September at the um, at the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, over the course of the festival circuit, we, you know, we we won the Audience Award in Chicago. We won the um, uh, we won uh, the Doc NYC. We won Memphis. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> And uh, and then and then then you kind of at the tail end of it they start campaigning. Uh, it's a very political process, but you start campaigning for the Oscars. Part of it is really political, and it's kind of this inside baseball weird Hollywood thing. Uh, but the other part of it is uh, that we hadn't gone. We'd been doing the festival circuit, but our, our film hadn't been in theaters yet. We hadn't done our official release yet, so not many people knew about the film. So what you start. What they started doing, the Weinstein Company started kind of showing the film to um, uh, uh, like credible celebrities and seeing if they would get behind it to support it, and then they would come and they would host the screening. And so when you have, uh, like for example, I mean some of it was kind of random, like Don Cheadle ho hosted one, Serena Williams hosted two, kind of random, but the idea is that if Serena Williams is going on a limb on our behalf, you know, it, it just garners attention. So we had a series of those um, uh, specifically for the Academy, for the Academy members to say, hey, this film exists. You should, you should absolutely see it. Uh, and in the process of campaigning, uh, you know, we did that for maybe like just two solid months, just going hard. And then one day we got a phone call uh, and uh, we were shortlisted. We were on the, the, the 15. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then we got nominated. You gotta believe in yourselves, fellas. You can come back. You just gotta go to work. We coming back, man. P-I-T-E-R. Oh, oh, oh. Let's go. Let's go, man. Vanessa trying to do again. Five man front. Drops, looks, throws. Got a man open and it's caught inside the five. Touchdown! First and ten. Here's the handoff, fumbling the ball, it's loose, and Manassas is coming with it, 25-yard line. You got a mask, they're laying down. You got a team mashing. Redmond, the back to the eyes in. Redmond drops straight back, looks, throws, it is caught, touchdown! 20 to 14, Manassas in the midst of a comeback. We just won the third quarter. If we win the th fourth quarter, we win the freaking game. Let's go get them, guys. Our publicist at the Weinstein Company called me at like five in the morning. She's like, are you up? And I'm like, no, I'm not up. Why are you asking? Uh, and she's like, you guys, you guys have just been nominated for an Academy Award. And I was like, click, you're full of it. Uh, uh, but no, then immediately I got up and went to my computer and sure enough, we, had, we were in the five. Uh, and then from there, it's, it's just another round of press and uh, a ton of press. Um, and then you kind of, in a weird way, you start kind of campaigning, obviously, for the win. The documentary Undefeated received one of the most prestigious awards. But did you know how small was the crew and how many cameras were recording during the production of the movie? A student from the School of Entertainment and Design Technology from Miami-Dade College asks T.J. Martin the question. The camera was a uh, uh, Panasonic uh, a HP 170, um, and uh, it's a it's a solid state, so it's not uh, you know it's a P it takes P2 cards and it's not interchangeable lenses. Okay. So that was really important for us just because it was such a um, Keep in mind, there's just it's just two of us shooting because our, our so there's three of us on the ground. There's my directing partner, myself, and uh, our producer. Our producer come can, kind of came from the studio world. He had zero production experience, so we're doing all facets of production, including sound. Um, so one reason we really like that camera was because it has uh, there's four channels, two 
for your inputs and then there's a default two more channels just that will never go off just in case you somehow screw up your audio. And that's just a, it's a bad mic, but it's your internal mic. Um, and then the other reason was because we didn't want to, we didn't want to miss a moment because we were switching lenses or putting lenses on. We literally could just pick up the camera and just boom, we were ready to go right away. It is always wise to have great advice from famous directors. TJ Martin has one for all filmmakers especially the students who love documentaries. You don't go into documentaries to make, to get rich. I'm not gonna, you know, you're gonna make a lot of money in documentary filmmaking. You can, Michael Moore does make a lot of money, but he makes more money in speaking engagements. Um, but you, you do it because you wanna tell stories and it's a labor of love. And maybe okay. there's something in the world that you think is really important that other people need to know about. And that's why you make a film and also you make it for the opportunity to make more films. So we saw this as an opportunity to go down and tell a story that we thought was really important, and more importantly, an opportunity to tell it, do it well, so that hopefully we get the opportunity to do it again, and then again, and then again, and then again. Um, and so in doing so, we gave up some ownership, but then we knew we'd be directors on our first, like I saved my first paycheck. I was like, it was like, it was like, I don't know, I can't remember how much it was. It was like, it, it, first of all, I got paid after, like it took a long time for the money to go through. So I got a lump sum after we'd already done shooting. It was like $19,000 for a director's fee. I was like, this is awesome. I'm gonna just frame this. I'm never gonna cash it ever. Uh, but just the fact it said director's fee, I was like, that's so cool. The documentary Undefeated is a true statement that anything is achievable. If you establish a goal then reaches for the stars. As a filmmaker, TJ Martin raised the bar very high and gave us great tips as students who are seeking success. I am Marlene Scott. Thank you for watching that special edition of Meatbook.